This is Lillian welcoming you to the 1953rd edition of the Enfield Talking Newspaper, dateline the 15th of May 2014. The readers this week are Joan, Beverly and myself Lillian with Colin on the controls. The items that we will be reading come from our local newspapers, the Enfield Gazette and Advertiser and the Enfield Independent and are their copyright. Our title music is Country Rock Polka, composed by Pat Prilly, Fernand Boulon, Harry Brewer, and performed by Jean Jack Perry, and is used with his kind permission. Local stories include Costs Force Charity to Close Down Care Home, MP and Group Seeking Answers on Forgotten Thalidomide Drug, Police warn residents to be vigilant when opening their door and illegal operations at doctor's surgery. If you are experiencing any problems receiving your Enfield Talking newspaper, please phone Diane de Jersey on 0208 805 6578. She is your listener's representative and she will be pleased to help you. And I have one special news item. It's just to remind you that the ETN AGM will be held on June the 16th, 2014 at Park Avenue in Enfield. If you require transport, please contact your listener's representative, Diane de Jersey, on 0208 805 6578. She will be pleased to help you. We look forward to seeing you there. And now over to Joan, who will read the first item of local news. An MP is throwing his weight behind a new parliamentary group convened specifically to unearth answers on a pregnancy testing drug dubbed the forgotten thalidomide. Nick Dubois, the Conservative MP for Enfield North, will be sitting alongside MPs from across the political divide today when the first meeting of the all-party parliamentary group on pregnancy testing drug Primodos takes place in the House of Commons. That drug was given to women as a means of testing for pregnancy in the 1960s and early 1970s before more sophisticated urine tests were developed. That drug contained a very high dose of hormones that would later be used in the morning after pill. Women were told that if they were pregnant, the high doses of progesterone would be absorbed into the body. And if they were not, the hormone would trigger menstruation. As featured previously in the advertiser, Enfield mother Chris Gooch, 65, of Carnarvon Avenue, believes the drug was responsible for leaving her daughter Emma with debilitating defects at birth, including fingers and toes that were only partly developed. In a bid to unearth answers on how much was known about possible side effects of the drug when it was prescribed to women such as Chris, Mr. Dubois will join with his colleagues to embark on a process of questioning drug company officials and re-examining the evidence. Parliament has ducked this issue for 30 years, he told the advertiser. I am delighted that we have a cross-party group of MPs who are going to press this issue and are going to get some answers. It leads me to believe for the first time we have the momentum to get some answers. Chris added, It is the first time I think that a group of MPs are collectively behind the campaign. 
It feels as though a lot of rubbish was buried a long time ago, but now it is coming to the surface. A spokeswoman from Bayer, which took over sharing the company that made the pills, told the advertiser, Bayer denies that Primodos was responsible for causing any deformities in children. Since the discontinuation of legal action in England in 1982, no new scientific knowledge has been produced which could call into question the validity of the previous assessment of there being no link between the use of Primodos and the occurrence of congenital abnormalities. Enfield police are warning the elderly about distraction burglars operating in the borough. Police are urging the public to be extra vigilant when unknown callers come to the door. The warning comes after one resident in the borough let a man posing as an electricity board employee enter his home. No items were taken, but the man is believed to have searched the house. The man is described as white male, aged around 40, 5 foot 3 inches tall and of medium build. Detectives Keith Kimberley, Enfield CID, said this type of crime is not only unpleasant but very upsetting for the victim. The bogus caller will try to gain their trust. Once they have tricked their way into a property, they will steal whatever they can find. Bogus callers sometimes pretend to be on official business from respectable companies. In this case, it was the electricity board, but it might be another utility company or as a tradesman working on behalf of someone else. Resident, residents can take some precautions to stop this happening to them. If you have a security chain, use it before opening the door to any unknown caller. Check their identification to make sure they are who they say they are. If they are a genuine caller, they will be happy to wait. I would urge anyone who thinks they might have fallen victim to a bogus caller to contact the police. Rita Jones, 71, of Queen Elizabeth Drive, Southgate, said she never opens the door to strangers. She said, I always look through my window before opening the door. You can get a lot of shifty people knocking. A care home in Southgate is to be closed after the charity that runs it deemed it too costly to maintain. The Sir Thomas Lipton Memorial Home in Chase Side will be shut later this summer. The Board of Trustees of Friends of the Elderly, the charity responsible for running the home, announced on Monday. It is home to 20 elderly residents, and the charity said that the large Victorian property, which is surrounded by five acres of grounds, had been running at a loss for a number of years, largely due to the costs of maintaining it to the standards required of a modern residential home. The decision had been made back in March as part of the charity's annual financial review Chris Paul, Director of Operations of Friends of the Elderly, said, This has been a difficult decision for us. The costs associated with upgrading the home make it impossible for us to operate it effectively and to bring it up to the efficient standards of larger, more modern homes. It is no longer fit for purpose. Over the next few weeks, we will be liaising with residents and their families to address any concerns and to come to understand their views. We will also be working closely with local adult social care teams to ensure residents are supported in a careful and dignified way and the home will not be closed until the final resident is rehoused appropriately. The house was built in 1808 and was run previously as a care home by the Sir Thomas Lipton Hostel Memorial Trust. The Friends of the Elderly took over eight years ago. The charity's nearest other homes are in Luton, Staines and Woking and a spokeswoman said it would help residents who wanted to find a new home with an alternative organisation. Mr. Poole added 
the needs and well-being of all existing residents are paramount. We believe there are more modern and user-friendly facilities in the area, which better serve their needs. The intention is to close the home in phases to minimize disruption to residents while they are rehoused. It is anticipated that all residents will have been moved out by the end of August. The charity has not yet decided whether it will put the property up for sale. For the first time, the Green Party in Enfield is putting up candidates in every ward in the borough. The Greens are pouring the majority of their energy into scooping a win in the currently Conservative-held Wilshmore Hill ward. The three ward candidates, Alison Phillips, Jean Robertson Malloy, Bill Clinton, are campaigning on a ticket of protecting the character of Winchmore Hill. They say they want to make the area a fairer place to live and pledge to campaign to boost affordable housing in a bid to stop young people being priced out. In keeping with their environmental credentials, they also want to transform the ward into a healthier place to live by promoting walking and cycling to boost health and cut pollution in the borough. Speaking to the advertiser, Ms Phillips explained that after the party's success in securing a 20 mile per hour speed limit along Hopper's Road, they are hopeful that the 700 signatures secured for the campaign can be translated into winning votes. The party supports the council's overhaul of infrastructure to make cycling safer and easier, but she added a cautionary note. It has to be implemented in the right way. Nobody, not us, not Enfield Council, wants to see empty shops. We do not think that increasing pedestrian and bike access means less trade. I understand fears, but we think that if this is implemented well, fewer cars will not mean a drop in trade. There are studies from different parts of the UK that show that if you make town centres more attractive places, it becomes more of a destination area, which in fact boosts local businesses. Insisting that her party will work hard for residents, she added, we are not the Labour Party or the Tories. We are good at listening to what people have to say and will work hard for them on their behalf. Um, Reducing spending council tax and the number of councillors are the main election pledges of Enfield Conservatives. Eschewing a launch event with the party faithful, leading Tories presented their manifesto solely to the press at the Enfield North Conservative Association in Baker Street, Enfield. The manifesto sets out a radical plan to cut the number of councillors by a third, from 63 to 42. If we are saying to staff that they should do more with less, it's only proper to ask ourselves if we need so many councillors, said Michael Lavender, the group's leader. Within the council's cabinet system, how much do backbenchers actually do? We really don't need this many councillors. Terry Neville, who has acted as shadow cabinet member for finance and property over the past four years, did not want to commit to how much he would like to cut council tax. He said, we have been speaking to senior officers about the £14 million in cuts that need to be delivered next year. A 1% cut in council tax would cost £1 million, which is very much possible. The Tories pledged to retain and reform the popular residence priority fund under which residents can apply for funding for community projects. 
on housing, Mr. Lavender said, it makes sense for us to build housing. Meridian Water is an important development. A part of the home should be socially rented for the communities of Enfield. We agree with Labour on that. Mr. Neville added, the real difference between us is that we manage money better. About the party's prospects, the leader said, I would not go as far as to say it's in the bag, but we stand a very good chance of winning. And I have an election special on behalf of Labour. Shadow Minister for London, Sadiq Khan, joined Labour colleagues for the launch of the party manifesto ahead of next week's council elections. Mr Khan, the MP for Tooting, teamed up with Labour leader Doug Taylor, former cabinet member for finance and property, Andrew Stafford and Edmonton MP Andy Love at a panel before more than 50 members at the Enfield North Constituency Party headquarters at Selbick Hall in Lancaster Road, Enfield. Mr Stafford said the Labour administration, which had taken over in 2010 after eight years of Tory rule, deserved another four years. Mr Taylor continued, the defining choice at a local level is between a Labour council which acts and a Tory council which fails to act. In the eight years of Conservative administration that preceded us, we saw a failure to take opportunities, but we will act. He went on to say that the issues the borough was facing included rapid population growth and an increase in the use of cars and pollution. He vowed that a new Labour Council would increase cycling opportunities and open a new civic amenity site in the east of the borough to recycle more household waste. The manifesto describes Enfield as the place to do business and the party vows to bring new businesses into the borough, create more apprenticeships and bring about 3,000 new jobs at the Meridian Water Development in Edmonton. We will encourage all employers in the borough to pay the living wage, Mr Taylor added. We need jobs with decent pay for a decent day's work. The manifesto promises include the construction of 10,000 new homes and improving the quality of privately rented homes through a landlord licensing scheme coming into force next year, as well as bringing more derelict homes back into use. Police officers more used to patrolling the borough's parks, will set out on the open road when they ride to Brighton for charity. Members of Enfield's Safer Parks team at Enfield Police Station in Silver Street have taken up the challenge of cycling from London to Brighton in aid of the Wildlife Rescue and Ambulance Service. This service, run by Barry and June Smitherman, provides help for animals across Enfield and Hertfordshire and is entirely dependent on donations. Hazel Edgar, one of the five officers making this journey, said, The Wildlife Rescue and Ambulance Service is quite close to our hearts. Anyone can take their animals there for 24 hours a day, all year round, and they will help. We deal with them all the time, and they are the only one in North London. They get called out and do so much stuff, just the two of them, which is fantastic. The team, who will also be riding for Brain Tumor Research, will saddle up on Sunday, June the 15th, and have so far raised £445 with a target of £500. Ms Edgar added, the team came together two months ago and everyone is really up for it. We all think it's a great idea. I am about halfway there. I have done about 30 miles. 
So training is in progress. Health inspectors are considering taking further action against a doctor surgery in Edmonton after discovering ongoing improper practices, including illegal operations. Dover House in Bolton Road, Edmonton, received a scathing report from the Care Quality Commission after an unannounced visit in October. And in a recent follow-up, inspectors found the surgery had failed to improve its practices, as well as discovering that surgical procedures were being carried out without the proper registration and authentication required by law. The surgery declined to discuss the report when contacted by the Enfield Independent, but one staff member insisted its only comment would be, we are not answerable to anyone. In October, inspectors criticised the surgery for its poor standards of care, welfare, infection control and medication. They found the principal GP had not undertaken the appropriate child safeguarding training and there were no up-to-date policies on protecting patients from risks of abuse. The report stated that the emergency equipment and procedures failed to meet required standards and put patient safety and welfare at risk. Infection control policy was found to be not fit for purpose or up to date and there was no staff training or risk assessments regarding infection prevention and control. When inspectors returned in February this year, the health watchdog found improvements in the surgery's medication storage and complaints procedure, but it also found there were still no emergency procedures in place and equipment for supporting patients during an emergency did not meet the required standards. The GP had also failed to carry out the proper training for safeguarding children and adults. Cleaning levels were criticised and inspectors said they found health and safety and infection control audits had not taken place to ensure the premises were safe for patients. They also found staff were undertaking surgical procedures without registration. The Care Quality Commission report, published on April 23rd, said the surgery had promised to clean up its act, but the watchdog said it is looking at taking further action. The report read, Due to the issues with infection control and premises risks, the provider informed us and the NHS England body that they would not conduct these surgical procedures until they had registered and would sought to remember rem sorry sought to remedy the issues found by both bodies a 6 year old who has survived leukemia played a leading role in a top class cycling race Casey Bex presented the prize jersey to the fastest British rider on stage four of the inaugural Friends of Life Women's Tour from Chessant to Wedding Garden City on Saturday. The schoolgirl from Chessant handed the jersey to Lizzie Armistead, who won silver in the London 2012 Olympics road race on behalf of blood cancer charity Leukemia and Lymphonia Research. Casey's mum, Nikki, described the experience as fantastic. It was absolutely amazing being on the podium, she said. I was honoured to get up there with Casey, and it was a fantastic day all round for our whole family. The charity, which was the official partner for the first women's stage race to be held in the UK, has particular significance for Casey and her family after she was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia in January 2010. Alarm bells rang for her parents when they discovered unexplained bruising on Casey's back when she was just two years old. They immediately took her to the family doctor who referred her to Aidan Brooks Hospital in Cambridge. Casey was diagnosed with the disease and underwent months of gruelling chemotherapy at Great Ormond Street Hospital in London. She completed the treatment in March 2012. Casey's father, Bradley, added, It's unbelievable to look at her now, compared with a couple of years ago when she was diagnosed. We soon learnt 
that because of the fantastic research into blood cancers, many people like Casey are beating the disease and going on to live their lives to the full. Anyone who is inspired by the women's tour can register for a range of cycling events run by leukemia and lymphoma research, including the London to Paris bike ride, which is on June the 19th to the 23rd, the London Bikeathon, which is on August the 31st, and the Birmingham Bikeathon, September the 21st. For more information, visit beatingbloodcancers.org.uk stroke get involved stroke sports challenges. A student basketball player has landed a scholarship at a university in the United States after sending over video footage of himself in training. Marcel Lee, who is about to finish a BTEC Level 3 in sport at Barnet and Southgate College, has fulfilled a dream he has had since primary school after being granted the scholarship to Hardin Simmons University in Abilene, Texas. The 19-year-old has completed Levels 1 to 3 of his sports BTEC and is due to finish his course at the college in High Street, Southgate, this summer. He was selected for the scholarship after sending videos of himself playing basketball to five different American universities, to which Hardin Simmons responded with interest. I got the idea that it would be possible for me to study and play basketball in America last summer, he said. My coach... Rob Weaver helped me, and we started making video recordings of my training sessions. When I got offered the scholarship, I was a little bit surprised, but I have worked so hard, and I knew I was good enough. I am looking forward to going. It's going to be great. The trial of three teenagers accused of the murder of Joshua Foltz will begin next week. The 17-year-old from New Southgate was stabbed to death on Bowes Road in Green Lanes in the early hours of December 3rd. Three men, Kreshnik Etemi, 18, of Hill Road, Muswell Hill, Hallie Ann Kay of Macefield Crescent, Southgate, and a 17-year-old boy who cannot be named will all stand trial on Monday, May 19th, accused of the murder of Mr. Folks. The teen was described by many as a cheeky chap, and his nickname was Josh Money Folks. The trio will appear at the Old Bailey.